What is up, boys and girls? This is a long-awaited podcast with myself and Fergus Crawley on episode 21 of the Fiber Performance Podcast. We are doing a collaboration with the guys over there, and we are really excited to bring you a little bit of brief history about myself and my training and uh, the mindset that goes into competing and trying to get to the highest level possible in CrossFit. So I hope you guys enjoy. James, how are we? Mate, I am going really, really well. So am I. This is a nice place. <laughs> this is a nice place. Gold, Gold Coast in general or this studio? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> and I'll add a third, Australia. Australia. Mate. Uh, although North Queensland is very humid and very poor Wi-Fi. Well, uh, this is you couldn't get more further from the opposite of where you're from. Where are you from again? Edinburgh, Scotland. So the most ba- Bad weather all the time rather than good weather all, all the, the time. time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So a straight swap, a straight swap. But let's kick things off. You're a man of many talents many pursuits. So if somebody was to say, James, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> How go, long you got? <laughs> I, I want three sentences, Max. My name is James Newbury. That was a poor use of words to start. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> they already knew that. Go again, yeah. go again. So, okay. In three sentences, I'm an ex-professional athlete. I'm an entrepreneur. And I love just chasing the vibe every single day. Very Australian answer. Mm, Very wise. It, okay, well, it was concise. There we go. Yeah. I saved you from our identity crisis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I fall under the same pressure when asked. But no, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there, and there's a lot that's brought you to this position. But I think growing up in Australia, like in Scotland, gives you access to loads of sport, loads of opportunity, and loads of things that you can expose yourself to. So what did you expose yourself to growing up in terms of sport, athleticism, that got you to the position that you are now? Yeah, that's um that's a super it's a super cool question because for us and I'm not sure if this is the same thing, you know, growing up um in the UK or in Scotland, it's in Australia, sport is at the crux of pretty much every childhood. You have the opportunity to do so much stuff as a kid and everything is in walking distance. So you wanna, you know, most of most of the our capital cities are by the beach. So you've got the option to go down and do nippers. So you can go down and do surf life saving carnivals, kinda like athletics, but on the beach. Um, using the implements down there in the water, so surf life-saving material. Then you've also got the option of going to Little Athletics, which is like junior track and field. Then you've got the opportunity to play soccer, football, rugby league. Um, you can play Australian rules football. as kind of like Gaelic football, but our version. Um, then you've got the opportunity to get involved in netball, swimming, like all of these extracurricular activities you can do. So you've got a plethora of exposure. And for me, when I first started out, I got stuck into soccer, um, just to, you know, I think my parents just wanted me and my brother to learn some hand-eye coordination, learn how to run, learn how to kick, learn how to do all that type of stuff, and then be part of something. So we did that for a few years. I hated it, didn't enjoy it, didn't kick a goal the entire time, wasn't very good. And then my dad said uh, to me, he goes, mate, I'd really like to see you have a crack at uh, Little Athletics. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool, what's that? And he goes, oh, you get to run and race and all this type of stuff. You get to jump and do all this cool stuff. And I was like, cool. So uh, dad took us down as a as – a group, me, my brother, my two sisters, and my youngest brother, Jack. And we went down to the local Little Athletics um, Club, did my first day, got absolutely spanked in a 70-meter race. And I was maybe eight years old at the time and didn't enjoy it. And immediately just yeah, wasn't good at that. So I decided that I wasn't good and didn't want to go back. And Dad said, oh, you should probably go back for another weekend. Uh, so I went back the next weekend. And, you know, on one week you do week A and the next week you do week B. So you might run a 70 that week and do a shot put and a high jump. And the next week you might run a 200 and then you would, you know, throw a javelin or you would throw a discus. And then instead of doing high jump, you'd do long jump or triple jump. And so the next weekend I got one piece of advice from a guy who – basically told me to do two things in the race look through the line of the end of my 100 meter sprint and keep my back straight so don't take my eyes off it don't look in the other lanes and keep my back nice and straight i did that ended up winning my race against the same crew that i was versing the weekend before immediately fell in love with the competing like instantly i was like wow the thrill of winning a race and the smile that it put on you know my dad's face because he saw i was happy and he was happy and it was just like a vibe and i was like okay i want to win everything so what bit of advice can i get to win the discus the high jump the shot put the 1500 the everything i wanted to win that and then i like that tr- kind of trickled into everything else and then i wanted to win my cross country cross country races i wanted to win everything and then basically from there i became somewhat competitive there i started doing semi well would go to states would compete there 
then I started becoming competitive at state level. Um, and that kind of, you know, once you build as a junior, I think the most, and even as a, as an elite pro, um, you know, we both played rugby and one of the most dangerous attributes of an athlete is speed. If you're, if you're a speedy runner, you're going to be dangerous on the field. And as a junior, I think even more so because then you don't, yet no one's really developed skills or traits to shut down speed. And so if you're fast, you're going to score points, you score points, you're valuable in the team. If you're valuable in the team, you're always got smiles on your face because you're always scoring points. So then I transitioned from athletics into rugby league. I played rugby league for about 10 years um, and started off uh, with, you know, a good, a good edge sprinting. So at that particular time, I was maybe 12 years old and uh, I fell in love with playing, I fell in love with playing rugby league, went and played state level, went and played um, at uh, like at nationals, made a couple of junior Australian teams um, frost it and I also love playing touch footy as well and, and tag and just try to immerse myself as much in there and all I wanted to do was go and play in the NRL that's what I wanted to do so I set my sights on doing that so I love to train love to get up early and get to the gym before school um, and just immerse myself in the training of you know the process because I learned a few lessons when I was doing little athletics I would always just miss out on podium I would always be fourth or fifth in a sprint race um, I got like I got a gold medal in shot port I did well in the high jump, got silver medal at States, but I could never crack a podium in the sprints. And my dad said, maybe if you did a bit of extra training during the week, you might find that you might be able to nudge a third, a second, or a first, find that, finally find that podium. And so then I asked him, I said, oh, what's training? And I didn't really understand. Everything at that particular time was just, you know, I'd pick things up on a Sunday at my local, local meet. That's what we did every week. Every Sunday was a local meet. And I started measuring out. I just said, oh, Dad, can you make me train? And he's just like, no. Nah. He goes, if you want to do it, you'll do it yourself. So that was a really good learning curve for me to understand that I had to be self-motivated if I wanted anything. And that really did help me understand that if I wanted to get that satisfaction of that podium position, that I had to put myself in that position and it was up to nobody else, I would be supported, but I wouldn't be forced. And I think that was a good learning curve for me. And I could have taken that two ways. I could have taken that as I'm not self-motivated enough and I'm just going to drop the ball here and I'm going to go play video games instead. Or I'm fired up enough because I love, I loved the feeling that I got from winning um, personally, but I also loved, I guess I loved the smiles that it put on my parents' faces at the same time. Like I enjoyed that just as much. Um, and that trickled through for the rest of my career, which I can touch on as well. But from there... I started, you know, measuring out the 100 meter track. So dad said, I'm not going to make you train, but I'll help you measure your tracks. He goes, I'll help you measure your 100 to 200 to 400. I'll do your admin. Yeah, I'll do your, <laughs> yeah essentially I'll do your admin. And mate, he's still doing my admin to these days. Like to this day, he's still doing all my admin. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we basically set that up. And then from there, it kind of transitioned into rugby league. Wanted to be a professional rugby league player. Played at a decently high level. Um, and then I kind of just stumbled from there into a CrossFit gym. And at that point in time, over the course of the last 15 years of doing sport, I'd picked up how to sprint, how to change direction, how to catch, how to throw, how to pass, how to, you know, keep my body, understand where my body sits and how it sits in relation to space. And I feel like that is something that when you pick up, when you transition into, say, the CrossFit gym, you already have gained all the skills that you need to then flourish. And that's basically, so my background would have been, you know, playing soccer, playing rugby league, little athletics. Um, I was down at the beach swimming as much as possible. I surfed. I surfed as much as I possibly could. I started surfing when I was nine years old. Um, I got into, you know, um, junior surf life saving. So I did a lot of that stuff, a lot of the, a lot of the beachy events, but I also love getting out on the boards. Um, but yeah, pretty much anything to get out of a day of school. That was pretty much it. I'd play, you know, I'd play tennis if I could, I'd play badminton if I could, I'd play netball, cofball, basketball, whatever it was, you know, whatever was good, I would go and play. So then that's basically how I transitioned into uh, the CrossFit gym. I'm glad you mentioned school at the end there because I was going to say there was very little mention of anything out with ah. the sporting medals within a younger age group. And normally at such an age group, there's a significant other part of life, but that was... Missed out on, but here we are. So it yeah. just, just goes to show that if you focus on things from the young age and you're passionate about them and you're intrinsically driven, it can take you a very, very long way. But being drawn to CrossFit was essentially a combination of all the skills and experiences that you'd had up until that point that you could then put into a competitive arena. But my lack of draw to CrossFit personally 
is that it deprives me of a lot of the things that I get from training from a personal and an outdoors point of view. So given that you grew up so much in the outdoors, given you grew up doing individual disciplines, individual sports, how did you cope with the transition into a very indoors environment? Obviously, your training was was outdoors. You've got the freedom to train how you want. Mm-hmm. But in a competitive arena, you had to perform in conditions that didn't give you the same sort of validation in terms of nature, nature mm. and the... the, 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 the the sweat equity of traveling a distance, of covering this, of moving your body in a certain mm. direction. It's yeah. kind of the, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost the uh, the sweat equity that goes into it. Yeah. Obviously, that's very, very much the case in a gym, but it's in a very enclosed echo chambery setting, which makes it feel quite different, I think. So how did you cope originally with not having access to that? Is that something you had to fill the void in separately? Mm. Or is it something you just viewed, that's the job, let's do this for as long as I can and see where we end up? Well, I think, I think for me, the, the biggest thing that, helped me a lot that I think a lot of people didn't do when they transition into the CrossFit space. They usually come from a gym background. They hadn't done a ton of running in the previous life, which I had done and I loved getting outside and I would run 3k time trials every week just to see where I'm at, just to see where I sit and how's my fitness feeling this week on Friday night time trial. Let's go. And I'll just do that by myself. So getting into the gym, I would go and do my CrossFit session, but then I'd always go out and run anyway. So I was getting outside into the into the wilderness and out into the sun and doing all these types of things at the same time whereas everybody else was just locking themselves away in the gym and then they're becoming very very good at crossfit box workouts but then as soon as you open up in every stage through the open to the nationals to the games you get more and more outside the box and that's where i kind of flourished the most um give me just a a very standard crossfit style workout 21 15 9 thrusters and pull-ups or something like that i'm not going to win i'm not going to be the best in the world at that i'll I'll do okay but then you mix that in with maybe a bit of biking and a bit of running or a bit of swimming or um uh, something you know a legless rope climb somewhere something a little bit unique or you know a, a, a pack run or a sandbag here to here that's where i'll kind of make up some ground so as we progress on and the, the workouts get more wide range and you need a bigger net, that's where I sort of started to progress. So I never really, when I trained for my first nationals, I was training in the front yard of my house, just in the driveway, just with a kettlebell and a skipping rope. And I would literally just do kettlebell swings, Turkish get-ups, double unders, and I'd run around the block. That's kind of how I trained. The amount of kettlebell work I did, because I only had a kettlebell. I did so much kettlebell work then. And then, I used to go to the local Anytime Fitness and I'd literally just do some deadlifts and I'd do some cleans and I'd lower the bar back down to the ground and I'd do my squats. So I'd get my my pull-ups done there too. I'd just do sets of pull-ups and then I would do some, you know, do some deadlifts and do some back squats and I'd get my kind of in the gym stuff done there very dysfunctionally. And then I would go back home and I'd do my wads at home and it was literally just cut like cardio. And I had always maintained a sense of the outdoors and like you mentioned, that sweat equity getting going from here to here, running from there to there, swimming from here to here, biking from there to there. I always did that anyway. Whereas a lot of people, when they found the gym, they stayed in the gym and they didn't really venture outside it. And then they only got so far. And then as the sport has progressed and evolved over time, you had to be an outdoorsy type of person to succeed. You had to figure out how to either learn how to get used to the outdoors and become accustomed with it um, if you didn't already have that. Uh, so a lot of people who have done well are either outdoorsy people in uh, salt, like deep in their soul, or if they weren't, they're an indoorsy type of person. Um, they had to then become very accustomed to getting outside and learning how to deal with that. And I just kept it as part of my routine all the time. And that was the difference between me and a lot of other people. I think and hope it will continue to evolve as it has done as well, where it becomes broader and broader in terms of the net it's casting people in. Because we had the conversation in the card, didn't we, that... I think the best thing that CrossFit can do from a relatability and entry point perspective is give the average population more of an understanding of what is entailed within CrossFit to be able to give them a perspective on where they could fit within it. Because what my biggest gripe, you know what, I will say it, I'll say it. Say it. Gripe (laughs) with CrossFit, and I've said this on the Omnia Performance Podcast before, is that everything is disguised with fatigue or with a weighted vest, which means that for a triathlete or somebody that runs park runs or somebody that's a competent 10K runner, they can't comprehend what that big Olympic lifting bloke there 
is like versus them. So they can't see any way in which they can fit into that ecosystem. I understand from a commercial point of view, you don't want, and I understand why it's put together that way. And we, we won't dwell on that. But essentially, I think this single discipline elements broaden it and open it up to more people. I agree. Which can therefore only be better for the sport, especially when the sport is so tied into commerciality. Logic would say that more bums on seats, more bums in boxes, more cleans in boxes, as it were, the further the sport will grow. 100%. So given that you are significantly more immersed in this, you've been to the games four times, you've placed fifth, what is your take on that? I think you've hit the nail on the head, and um, I've definitely spoken about this, and especially in the car with you earlier before, that the relatability at the moment between people in other sports and other realms of fitness and there are many realms of fitness. You've got power lifters, you've got strongmen, you've got Olympic lifters, you've got triathletes, you've got uh, people doing Spartan races, you've got people doing high rocks these days, you've got people having a crack over it, you know, doing turf games, and that's a bit of a functional hybrid thing too. But those specific sports like the triathlon, the um, the 10K runners, the 5K runners, the 100-meter sprinters, the athletic stuff that we all started with as a basis – I would love to see them tested because every time you do a test like that at the CrossFit Games, especially when you're putting out to the world that we have the fittest athletes on the planet, people want to know. Because I, I think that pushes people even further away. Because if they read that in a Facebook thread, the fittest athletes in the world, but I don't know how much you can... They laugh. Yeah, I don't know how much you can deadlift. I'm a powerlifter and deadlift seven pa- 700 pounds. Yeah. Or I don't know how much you can run, a f- how fast you can run a 5K. Yeah. I run it in 1730. <laughs> Yeah. It pushes people, it, it goes the other direction, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And I feel like if we were to do a few tests where, you know, every year there was maybe, you know, maybe even a triplet, like a workout that was, you know, made up of some relatable niche tests that come from another sport that were, you know, maybe petitioned as a, you know, a, a 30 point split over a course of, you know, 90 points rather than taking a full hundred and put those specific small tasks to the test, like a hundred meter sprint or a 200 meter sprint. Would be, it would be wildly fun to watch. Wildly fun to watch. <laughs> I don't be. know why. Like The YouTube comments from 200-meter sprinters would be fantastic. It would be hectic. And then, you know what? Every now and again, you would have someone from the field rise to the top and be like, you know what? That is freaking insane. And you, bring, you bring out the best of people's backgrounds as well. Because, Definitely. for example, I mean, you, you had a background in 400 meters. I know you were quicker when you were younger. If there was a 400-meter event where it was best effort 400 meters, mm. rest 90 seconds, go and do a wad. Yeah. That'd be really interesting. That'd and then you'd see you shine. You'd then see people that had never done athletics fall behind, but then you might have the person that was a weapon in the water when they were younger yeah. that smokes everyone, yeah. even though they came last in the 400 meters. And that's exactly right. And we did a, we did a run um, two years ago at the game, but it was a 500 meter run. So it was unrelatable. Make it a four. Yeah. A four would yeah. have been sick. But, but I, I personally, it's on purpose. It is on purpose because it mean, it, it, it solidifies the claim that, we are the fittest athletes on the planet because it doesn't give people parameters to work within it, yeah. which is personally what stops me from wanting to get involved because I enjoyed the parameters of single discipline yeah, sports yeah. and like to operate within them. But I accept I'm an average triathlete. I'm an average lifter, mm. but I can be average at a lot of things all at once. And that's because I enjoy being average at all of them. Sure. But I think the main thing is the acceptance that I'm average and I'm not going to pretend that I'm a fantastic triathlete because I also do it alongside lifting. Sure. No, I'm an average triathlete, yeah, yeah. but I'm also stronger than the person next to me on the bike potentially. Yeah. So I think it's the acceptance, which is what as an organization, yeah. as a community, it's potentially wanting to move away from. And I, I do understand why this isn't, this isn't, a, yeah. this isn't a complaint. It's just, it, it, it stops me as somebody who's heavily immersed in, fitness in a lot of the disciplines in crossfit from wanting to give it a crack yeah because i like a lot of single discipline yeah, sports yeah. that are well established and, and have a huge uptake and that's been that's the consensus for the most part of a lot of the a lot of the spectators that would be watching otherwise so if um you know for instance we had a competition a few weekends ago and the final event so it was teams of four the final event was a four by four by 100 meter relay it was the most fun thing to watch that we've seen in a CrossFit event in years. It was fun. It, it reminded everybody of sports day. Was it a, a light kettlebell being handed, handed <laughs> yeah, over? Well, <laughs> hey, we, we got, we brought back the, the, um, the pearlescent battens and it was a blast. Like we had such a good time and we, everyone was just out of the whole weekend. Everyone was just hyped about this four by 100 meter relay. It was awesome. And 
something like that would bring a lot of people, you know, we did a four by, you do a four by 100 meter relay. Um, and they do do that at some of the national competitions where you've got a couple of, couple of females running and a couple of males running and, you know, you can have some comparison there, but make it more specific again and chuck in, even just chuck in a, an Olympic distance triathlon as part of our endurance event. And let's see how good they go because that is the interesting part. Then you open up the, the spectator viewers like, oh, the CrossFit Games did an Olympic distance triathlon. That is cool. What are their times? How can I compare? Well, you know what? I've got a time that is similar or better or, you know, that intrigues me. Maybe I will venture on down to my CrossFit gym and see how good I really am and then I'll do some deadlifts and be like, wow, they can deadlift 200 kilos and I'm only deadlifting 90 and they're still doing similar times to me in the triathlon. That is insane. That's, that's, that's exactly it. That, that's exactly where I see the value. Like uh, even a super total where you can squat low bar, you yep. can pull sumo because yep. then the power of this can be, oh, cool, wow, these people are jacked. These people are as strong as I am, yep. but they're also really fit. Maybe that means that I don't need to just be a powerlifter and actually I can play 18 holes of golf at the weekend Absolutely. or go go for a longer walk with my dog, yeah. not having to worry about my heavy squats. And that's how I used to exist when I was a powerlifter. I was worried about long rounds of golf, long walks, because it would impact my heavy squats. 100%. Whereas now I can't really go a day without covering a decent distance. Yeah. And, the, you know, one of the coolest events that they did this year, and this is, I think, uh, props to Boz for the programming, um, or last year, should I say, um, they did introduce in the log lift. So there was a, a log lift in there. And, you know, I went to an event the following weekend in Sydney, and it was a hybrid event. But all the strongmen that were there were talking about the CrossFit Games log lifting event. And they were like, Man, some of those girls were lifting some insane numbers that would have been very competitive in the in the strong man space or strong woman space. Same with the fellas. He was like, you know, there were guys there at 87 kilos doing 130, 135 kilo logs, which for a lot of the countries is national level like weight li like national level log lifts. And you've had to adapt quickly to the technique of log lifting, which is very specific yeah. and different to a regular push press. Yeah, and you've only touched it maybe five times in your life. And, you know, and then they're just like, okay, cool. That's, that's you know, it's it's sparking more conversation instead of just like, uh, you know, CrossFit's wanky. You know, it's just, it's like it sparks conversation in the right direction just by adding those things in from time to time. And I feel like they're getting there slowly but surely. I feel like back in the day, there was such a bias for just being, really good at Olympic lifting and pretty average at everything else. Then it yeah. went through a phase of edging a little bit more towards swim, swimming and, and running, um, not so much biking, but swimming and running was introduced more. And then when, if you look at the last, say, six or seven or eight years of CrossFit, 50% of the workouts have some form of running in them of, you know, 250 plus meters up to, you know, a couple of Ks. So that you have to be a decent runner if you want to be near the top of the field. You have to be running, you know, you're roughly running five minute miles if you want to be at the top of the field. That is like maybe a top five type of running time. But then you also should be running, you know, sub 19, five Ks and you should be running, you know, sub 43, 10 Ks and, you know, ideally and even quicker if you want to be even better. But then you also then start to potentially sacrifice you know, some of your top end Olympic lifting, but you know, obviously cream rises to the top and if you're good at everything, then you'll end up winning. So, but I think, yeah, you're, you're spot on. And for me, adding in those types of elements, which I loved as a kid, I didn't come, and this is, this is something because I owned my gym for 10 years and I'd have people walk into the gym at 24 years old and say to me, I want to go to the CrossFit Games. I was like, great, that's such a good goal. Awesome. Well, let's get through the first class and then let's see how you feel about everything. And it's like, what is your sporting background? Nothing, nothing. It's because you never played netball. You never did basketball. You never did little athletics. You never swam. No, no, no. Just, you know, it just looks awesome. And I, you know, did my fitness class at the gym. You're missing out on 15. It's not, it's not just that year of training that gets you to the games or gets you to nationals or the two years of training that gets you to the games and nationals. It's the 15 years built as a kid, learning all these skills and learning how to move your body in space and adapting and then watching someone do something and replicating it very close and quickly. Like you don't have 12 months to get a muscle up. You have two weeks to get a muscle up and then you have one month to get 10 muscle ups strung together. That's kind of at the point where you need it. And like you were saying earlier, we're going through a phase where people are coming out of collegiate sport, coming out of university sport, coming out of ex-professional sport and then working their way into CrossFit and they're getting only so far. And, you know, that's the, that's the top of the game. Now you're getting people that jumping into junior sport and their junior sport is CrossFit. How good are they going to get? Are they going to, you know, are they going to be running 430 miles and, you know, 
powerlifting total 650 or 700 kilos you know that's probably where they're looking at going when you find an absolute freak of nature that adapts really well and has a good mindset for it and can handle the workload what, what's got me really hyped about this conversation specifically today is running running along the gold coast today where did we go from to so we went from broad beach to burley heads and back lovely route really enjoyed it and along the way it was just so cool to me to see everybody up early getting after it yeah walking their dogs having a coffee socializing running not headphones, running in groups, enjoying it, getting involved and doing something. There's a clear commitment being shown and there's a clear foundation of habits that underpins all that. And that, to me, is why I get so frustrated with triathletes that are so in their box about X or CrossFitters that are so in their box about Y Mm. and why the friction between them is only raising the entry point for the people that might not necessarily be there yet. And the more people that can be involved in fitness in a general term and experience the value it can give you on a long-term basis, the better we are as a species, which is a big big claim, big claim. But nonetheless, seeing people in that sort of microcosm mm. petri dish that is the gulf coast today bringing that to life yeah. because i don't there isn't there isn't that where i'm from you don't really have that in its in such a high concentration in any one area in any part of the uk unless you're in a gym or at a running track wow so for me that was really stark this morning to see which is why having this conversation is so interesting because i i, I just i see the value in the range of fitness disciplines no one is inherently better than the other and I think a lot of sports would learn a lot from the sports that they often find themselves bashing heads with. Yeah, 100%. And that's where I think the sort of discussion we've just had is really the crux of, well, my, my opinion, and, and mm. by the sounds of things, yours, in terms of where CrossFit could be. The, the, I mean, it will consider itself, I'm sure you consider it, the leader in this space, but I think it could be doing a lot more mm. long-term, yeah. and I hope that it does, for the general population in terms of reducing the entry point to yeah. the self-development that is habitual commitment to fitness. Well, that's the, that's the other thing that it could go in the, it could go in the opposite direction in terms of skill acquisition, because if you consider that we grow up, we, we've grown up or I've grown up in a space where we are exposed to athletics and yeah. soccer and football and rugby league and volleyball and everything that you can possibly get your hands on, then you take that and you refine it and refine it and refine it. And then you say, you're going to go do this swimming event. And then you're going to go do this uh, Olympic lifting event. You're going to go do this, you know, um, entry level gymnastics thing. And you're going to get very, very good at CrossFit, but you don't have that. (laughs) Yeah. Don't don't, don't drop your phone. You won't catch it. Yeah. Raw (laughs) athletic ability that you get from playing netball or playing yep. rugby you know that you just have to do to understand it's the kinetic learning i think yeah i think it's uh like you said be able to look at something visually and then replicate it that's where skateboarding for me translated to yep. snowboarding yeah where snowboarding then translated to skiing because i could look at skiers and understand how they were moving and just go oh yeah that, that's it go. yeah off we go and that's what I, I credit that ability to a very wide-ranging skill acquisition as a young age, thankful to my parents for exposing me to so many different sports. 100%. But you, you are right. It could mm. be the flip side. If, if, if the world becomes CrossFit HQ, mm. if CrossFit HQ penetrates the White House, then <laughs> we could have a very, very jacked, competent, athletic nation mm. that couldn't catch a ball. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is the thing I'm thinking about. Like... And I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or whether it's going to be refined only to CrossFit as a sport. Um, but then a, a part of a part of so a part of CrossFit in, in general back in the day, this was so talked about and I think it's lost it gets brought up every few years, is okay, you need to have your nutrition on point, you need to be looking after your lifestyle. Then you need to be focusing on aerobic ability. That was the next one. So metabolic conditioning in some way, shape or form, and whether you Consider, we don't really consider twenty minute wads an endurance event at all in, in our in our frame of mind. James, let's not go down this rabbit hole. <laughs> I feel like I feel like any CrossFit is watching will already hate me. So apologies. <laughs> just just to clarify, I have an enormous amount of respect for it. I just really enjoy this discussion because yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, as I've said, entry point here. I'd love it to be here, but I feel like um, and I can't remember. And everyone's going to crush me for this. I can't remember where playing sport comes back into that pyramid, but it is in the pyramid somewhere. But I feel like get out and play. And this is what Matt, my other business partner, talks about so much. We just want to get out and 
play with as many different things as we possibly can, getting out and playing and exposing yourself to things that make you think a little more, ex- get you gain you a little bit more experience in something, get you to meet and socialize and network with other areas and not just people but environments and settings and um, stimulus like catching and throwing and swimming and uh, uh, jumping off a bridge, I don't know, like jumping into water, or something like that. Th- those types of going out and playing in general in what we have here on, you know, on, on the Gold Coast, getting out and immersing yourself in as many different things as possible is just going to enlighten you just a little bit more on what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy and if you just refine yourself to this small box and this small path then you're kind of you're limiting yourself to a certain space and maybe you love that maybe you do love that but it's just keep an open mind and you might find something that really fires you up so that's something that you're a fantastic advocate for because you are a very multi-discipline athlete you are a very multi-discipline human being as you described you are hi i'm james newbury the irrelevant <laughs> sentence that it was <laughs> uh, i got uh, flustered <laughs> ex-professional athlete entrepreneur and good vibe chaser so the entrepreneur element and the good vibe chaser those are the two components that we haven't discussed within the context of the first and i think what you've described just there is essentially the ecosystem that you are living and breathing so it's as if you've taken you've taken the ethos of what crossfit was intended to solve the problem for originally mm. and continue to carry it forwards out with a competitive environment as well, which I think is critical. And that's where I think the value is and can continue to be. And that's what I think CrossFit has done to fitness, which has completely changed the game. Classes are now social events. They've taken people out of boozers into gym classes with beat pumping at six in the morning. Mm. Brilliant. But you are also a multiple entrepreneur. You have a lot going on. It's Mm. difficult to manage. But do you want to just run us through, in terms of timeline very briefly what career looked like for you before crossfit became full-time sure sure. and then how that developed into an entrepreneurial development journey sure okay so back in the day i always wanted to be autonomous with whatever i did i wanted to be able to pick and choose what i wanted to do didn't really like being told what to do so i kind of found myself you know hopping from i was exposed to you know working at the local hungry jacks for a little while three months until summer kicked in and then i decided the beach was better and then funny that yeah (laughs) and then you know like I was you know I got a job working at a a fishing and tackle shop when I was 13 years old because I just wanted some extra fishing gear and I said I would trade my time for uh, store credit and then I worked at a you know a winery a winery doing bird netting for the vineyards store credit again yeah Yeah, pretty well yeah I was actually I think I was getting eight bucks an hour it was pretty good I was like stoked Um, three dollars improvement from my store credit And then from there, I moved into a bunch of different roles, uh, ones where I could work during the night. So I couldn't, I didn't have to sacrifice training in the afternoon. So I'd go to school, I would get up, you know, do 5.15 gym session at my mate's place in in his shed. Then we'd go to school. Then I would go and do football training, the rugby rugby training. And then after that, I would go and set up like concerts with audio and visual. I'd just go set them up during the night time. And I'd do that again. And that's what I did, you know, during most of my schooling time. I ran a couple of businesses during my schooling time too not all of which i'm super proud of um but i did a i had a <laughs> i had a an id business going at one particular time when i was like 16 years old i could i'm pretty handy on photoshop so i was doing pretty well there and kind of like made my way through school and i could pick and choose my hours it was great and that was kind of where my entrepreneurial fire kind of came into it i kind of at that particular time and obviously i didn't do it for very long um but i thought it was a good idea at the time and you know that was young James, but in saying that it also expressed to me how to manage working with with people, working with um, getting things done, working on my own schedule, how much I enjoyed dictating my own time, where I saw the best value and how I could manipulate that to best be it to my advantage. From there, I moved into um, working in some sales jobs. I did, I was an MC at a couple of gyms. I was a membership consultant. I love chatting to people, love getting to know someone, loved getting them, pushing them towards health and fitness goals. I was into that um, and I still am to this day. And so when I found myself excelling in sport, I wanted to teach people sport and fitness and I thought that was a really good path that I could go down. So then I became a PT. Um, Didn't do it for very long, just as one-on-one PT stuff. Uh, From there, dabbled in a, a little bit of outdoor boot camp and whatnot. And then I 
uh, found myself playing rugby league. I also worked in a, a bunch. I, I would say give me 10, 10 to 15 other jobs in the, that vicinity. I worked at Hertz, you know, um, washing cars before I would do my football training. I, like I had to move state. I was doing, you know, door knocking insulation jobs, you know, trying to sell insulation to people for their houses. Which is baptism by fire. Yeah. In terms of dealing with people and yeah. and learning how to sell and learning how yeah. to take rejection and carrying that forwards with you is, is oh. huge. And that was such a good learning curve for me and I'm so glad I did it because that taught me so many cool things about, you know, we live in such a social media navigated selling e-com space these days that sometimes people just need a handshake and you might do the deal of your life with a, a just a meeting um, a networking meeting or a handshake or saying good day face to face with someone and that might just go above and beyond you know a thousand dollar a week ad spend or a thousand dollar a day ad spend and you'll get more from it as yeah. the person committing the spend as well yeah some it's like we talked about before it's like you might have a million followers but only 5k of them are really invested in you and the rest is just fluff uh, you'd rather have 50k followers and die hard followers you know or even you know or even 15k followers and die hard followers because at the end of the day, you know, you might be doing this ad spend and it's fluff around the edges and then you might go and shake a hand with three people that are your absolutely, you know, they're your mates and then you work for each other and they want to bring you up and then they might be the best deal you've ever done and you only have to do three of them. Whereas, you you know, you might touch, you know, 50,000 people in an, in an ad. In an it's, ad the, it's the exact same principle as is. don't stay in the CrossFit box, isn't it? Yeah, get it's outside. and Don't stay behind the desk plugging in ad spend. 100%. And so I took the skills that I got from there and transitioned them into the next thing. And I want, and then I ended up getting into Sydney. And when I got to Sydney, I ended up wanting to be a, a CrossFit coach. Um, I found myself in a CrossFit gym, absolutely loved the vibe. I loved the difference between training really hard, which I did for my rugby league career. I put it first, everything was first for rugby league. And then it always came down to uh, the coaches call on who best suited that position. Are they better friends with each other? Maybe put them in, you know, six and seven or, or, that prop doesn't really like him. So it's social science, essentially, isn't it? Social science. And yeah. I wasn't about it because I came from Adelaide and Adelaide's not a rugby league state. So instantly you're put at the bottom of the rung. You might have every every skill, every ability to do what the next person does, but then it really depends on you know, who, grew, who grew up closest together and who has the best recipe to do well. And I then sat down and I looked at someone who was 28 years old. I was 20 at the time. 28 years old, playing at the same club, same position as me, doing the same thing, having a beer after training, and he had never had it run at first grade. I thought to myself, fuck that. I'm not doing that. Don't want to be there. Thanks. So I decided I'm going to open a CrossFit gym. And I was like, I get to run my own schedule. I get to have my own place. I get to be invested in myself. Screw it. That's what I'm going to do. So I went and worked out in, in the mines. I did that for about 12 months, saved up enough money, um, did a couple other things, bought a block of land. We did... Um, bought and sold a block of land, subdivided that stuff. And then in the course of that 12 months, then opened a gym and then basically ran through, had my gym um, up until just recently. And then along the lines through that, throughout that whole period, there's always things popping up from time to time. Tried to start a chalk business at one particular time, did online programming for a long period of time, um, set up a, an e-com like timer business, which still ticking over today, the tiny timer. Then from there, um, I'm probably missing things here, but eBooks, I've done a ton of eBooks, um, a lot of e-com work. And then just recently just started a business called Fiber, which is our supplement company. Um, just started another business with a mate of mine, Khan, which is swimwear. So basically uh, Dickies, uh, Speedos. And then we try and refrain from using any other brand's names because they've monopolized it. But Budgie, we still buy Budgie. Like the thing is, like if Budgie come out with a cool design, like we're happy to support them. So Khan bought Budgie's the other day and he's just like, look at these things I got. They're sick. We, in the UK, we, we just call Speedos Budgies as well. Yeah. At, at least in my social circles, rugby background, they're just known as Budgies because they have monopolized the Speedo market and, in the UK. And that was their ploy. And in the beginning, they said, we want to change the name of what these are from Speedos to Budgie Smugglers and Budgies. Well, and they it. did it. Yeah, they did it. And so we still kind of refer them to as budgies. But yeah, so we have La Boys um, and that's growing and expanding at the moment. And then I also have another business with my brother, which is Soul Sense, which is basically uh, plant-based plant -based chemical-free fragrances um, that you can kind of either have in a balm or you can have in a, in a liquid spray. Um, but then it also comes in diffuses and makes, it, makes your place smell nice without you know clogging you up full of chem chemicals at the same time. So I have a flight to catch in about... 14 hours, <laughs> which means that I'm not going to uh, unpack each and every one of those businesses because no, I'll cool. miss it. Yeah. 
So what what is at the core of all that? Because there is so much there and there'll be people listening thinking, what on earth is going on? Mm. There'll be people, there's probably people thinking that's too much. He spread himself too thin. None of those businesses can be successful. There'll Mm. be the naysayers there. There'll be people saying, how could he do that? He's superhuman or or has he stopped training or all these things? There'll be be sort of people trying to stack it up against their own lives as we will inherently do as humans. Mm -hmm. And there'll be people thinking, wow, how exciting. There's so much going on there. How can I turn my passions into something like that? So for all three of those categories, if Mm. there's anyone I've missed and you're feeling a different way, apologies. But essentially for everyone listening, what what is at the core of all that? Because there's so much going on. There's so much business. You're spread across industries to some degree. You're spread across uh, purchase order focused businesses, online businesses. Mm. You're still training. Mm. You're still creating content on social media. How do you, as an individual, manage it? And what what at the core is driving you? Is it money? Is it prestige? Is it happiness? Is it just filling the time in the day? What is it? For me, everything I do is about experience. I love to. As I said to you before, I love the experience of meeting new people. I love the experience of trying something hard. And that thing, that hard thing could be a hard iron man. That could be starting a new business. That could be a startup. That could be expressing myself in a different way. I love a project. I love working on old cars. I tinker around with old cars as well. And it's just for the experience and the experience alone. And what I look for when I do these businesses, I'll dip my toe in the water in anything that I think might have legs or might and legs, not not just to the degree that this might have legs to make money, but legs to the degree that it might make me happy. It might make me fired up to jump out of bed in the morning to get after it. And every day I, I wake up at the moment and I cannot complain about a single thing. Things do go wrong and that's great. I used to like, I used to get negative about things when they went wrong. Now I get fired up. It's like, great. I get to put some of the skills that I've learned being a professional athlete to the test and figure out a way to navigate how do we fix this and how do we make it better than we thought it was going to be and that gets me jumping out of bed to get after that so i'm looking for the experience and at the end of the day i want to help people become happier healthier and just be vibing to jump out of bed to attack their day and have a good life and i think you know with fiber that's our that's our mission is to make people happy make people healthier make people look at the system that they live in and try and create a holistic approach that's going to help them express them the best way they possibly can. You know, for the boys, it's about being more you and not letting yourself get too too hung up on what you feel like you should be or what social media feels like you should be, but letting you express you for you and how you want to be. And that's basically wearing what you like, wearing how you feel, um, you know, being a bit weird. If you want to be weird, if you want to be extroverted one day and introverted the next, up to you, man. Go for gold. Um, and then Soul Sense is a passion project that I wanted to do with my brother, who's you know my best mate. And it was more for us to bond in a different way and very much like Fiber with my business partner Maddie, Khan with my business partner in La Boys, and my brother, my business partner with. Um, soul sense and then my dad is almost like a business partner across all three of them he just helps me with navigating all of the admin and it's me connecting with my close friends on a more personable level and that excites me it makes me feel fulfilled and it also makes me fired up to put a smile on someone's face for that day every time i get up i'm just like oh this is going to be our great day we're going to have this meeting and it's going to go great and if it doesn't we'll rectify it we'll make it better And it's just literally the fire that sits inside me that I once had for competing at CrossFit at a high level has now just been redirected into a different direction. And whilst I still love getting after running marathons and half marathons and lifting weights and doing Ironmans and strongman competitions and having a crack at that stuff, which I kind of just sign up for randomly. And like you do as well, you get four weeks out from a comp. That looks like fun. Let's do it. Who can I invite with me? And who can I invite to come and share this experience and who's going to, you know, we're going to cross the line together and we're going to have smiles on our face. We're going to remember it for the rest of our lives. That's what I look for. And with the businesses, same deal. Let's build this beautiful thing that's going to amount to all this cool experience and we're going to get to the end of it and we're going to put a smile on each other's faces and we're going to have a really cool story to tell and remember and a learning experience at the same time. That's what fires me up. So what lessons have you taken from professional CrossFit as a career that have translated into business? And are there any of them that you think are universally applicable to all those listening? Absolutely. So number one, this was taught to me at a very young age. I have my dad to thank for this is delayed gratification. 
it's like if you expect something to happen overnight for you, 99.9% of the time, it's not going to happen. If you can be okay with chopping wood and carrying water every single day and doing the basics really, really, really well on a daily basis, every single day as part of your lifestyle, you will probably be elite in any category you set your sights on. So do the basics and do them well. Be prepared for things not to happen overnight and it might be a 10-year process, but you will feel like every bit of that time was worthwhile. It took me five years to get to the CrossFit Games and if I didn't make it that fifth year, who knows if I would still be doing it. Then that was really, at that point in time, if I didn't make it that year, I may have just stopped and just gone and run my gym. That was really the start of my career at that particular time. Then for the next four years, I competed at the CrossFit Games, very disappointed with all my placings until that fourth year. And then I finally got a fifth place and I felt like that whole nine years, it wasn't that one year of training or the second or the two. It was that whole nine years plus the 15 years of developing all those skills that amounted to that fifth place at the CrossFit Games. And that's when I felt like, yes, that was... And you could be happy with it. That's the main thing. Happy with the whole nine years of trying. Happy with every single one, no matter how shitty I felt in 16, 17 and 18 about my results and what it looked like on the scoreboard. I was... When I got that fifth place and I was getting a, a, a trophy for the most improved from 2018 to 2019, I was like, all of those nights spent in the gym at eight o'clock on a Saturday night while all my friends are out partying, so worth it every single time. And that goes the same hand in hand with business. This is not going to be an overnight success. These things are going to take time. It's going to, could take a year or two or three or five or 10, but I will get to a point where I'll be like, oh my God, I learned so much cool stuff. I met so many cool people. I traveled to the coolest places on the planet and everything was worth it, worth all of that, all of the struggle that you go through and all of the kickbacks and all of the, um, the, the, um, the, the no's that you get along the way, all well worth it. And that's going to happen plenty more, I hope. I hope. Like all these things, they amount to the whole experience and the whole journey that you know, I guess we call life. But those things, knowing now what I know from, you know, putting so much effort and time into that CrossFit career, I've taken so many of those learning experiences and just I know that whatever uh, – this is, I actually was given this a piece of advice. I've spoken to a lot of sports psychologists in the past and a lot of people and I found that the best information I ever got was from a counsellor who I sat down with and she didn't even charge me. She literally just sat down with me and anytime I wanted to chat, we, I'd send her a text and say, hey, I've got a comp coming up, feeling a bit agitated about it. Can we have a chat? And all I had to do was buy her peppermint tea. And she said to me, I just said, oh, what she goes, what are you stressed about? I was like, well, we have this snatch event coming up in this event and you only get two cracks at it. And if you miss them both, you're DNF'd, you're done. You're done for the whole weekend. You can't miss it. And it's, you got, you're lifting 90% or, or plus. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to hit it. Don't know, I'm going to walk out there and forget how to snatch completely and just stuff it up. And that goes through most athletes' minds. And she goes, okay, cool. Let me put this in perspective. When was the last time you forgot how to snatch? Ever. I was like, I never have. She goes, okay, cool. Why are you worrying about it? You don't ever forget how to snatch, but you're worrying about the one thing that's never happened. And I was like, great. Okay, cool. So that put it in perspective. And now I've transitioned that into the train of thought. What is the last thing that I focused my complete and utter laser focused on that I did not succeed in? Can't think of it. So I know whatever I attack with absolute 100% laser focus and with no distractions and I put everything into it will go well that's it is there a, is there a destination or are you completely journey oriented completely journey there's no one particular point that I'm just like if I get to here I'm going to be good because I know that does not exist I know that every time that I've crossed a bridge or kicked a goal I've put the goal post further back it happens every time so I've stopped chasing that all I'm looking for is fun enjoyment put a smile on my face every day, do it to somebody else, and I'm good. Just That's keep, it. Keep That's doing it. that every day. I, I think it's the healthiest way to exist, and it's something that I, I'm i not as good at as I'd like to be, but it's something I'm working on. So for anyone listening that feels that they are constantly moving the goalposts, you're always going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're never going to find – I don't think you're ever going to find that, that space where you're just like, you know what, I'm just good to die. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I just feel like you're always going to be searching for – a little bit more enlightenment and I feel like that's that's cool it's part of the journey and that's what I like I enjoy the journey part of, part of it and I had someone ask me the other day I got a call 
um, from a friend of mine who's in Sydney and we don't see each other very often, but he said, how you doing? And I'm like, mate, I honestly am living my best life. I'm having a good time. I'm happy on a daily basis, jump out of bed, getting ready to go after. And I know not everyone is in that position and that they're, they're the people that I would like to help, you know, through education and meetups and, you know, just trying, I guess, to inspire somewhat of a change in someone. And if I can just do that by telling a story, that might just kick them into gear to trying something different or keeping an open mind to trying something new. And that just might be the thing that makes them a little bit happier on a daily basis. And I feel like if I'm doing that on a daily basis, you know, I'm, I'm walking the walk. And if I can help people do the same thing, then it's just, it's all just good karma just flowing through everyone. You know, that's like kind of where I'm at. And I'm just enjoying just, you know, just plugging away and doing my thing and, and meeting really cool people along the way. Like yourself, like we, we haven't met until today, but we've conversed a little bit through IG and, you know, I feel like this is a long time coming. I was like, man, I've got to meet this guy. I feel like he's my my British brother from a, from another, from another my uh, dreadlocks aren't quite as impressive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hence, the, hence the hat that I'm hiding them with. There's something. There's something in the works. Don't worry. But I feel like this is the whole part of it. Is you know we've got all this really cool opportunity, and it's like okay, who actually wants to go knock on all these doors? That, that, that's it. It's, it's the only way you can you can become more journey oriented rather than destination focused is by taking risks and exposing to things that you are uncomfortable at the thought of. That applies to training, that applies to business, that applies to general development, relationships, all of the above. Mm. I think that's sort of the, the core tenet of how I exist. Is yeah. If it feels like something that is going to be risky, challenging, but rewarding, 99 times out of 100, in my experience, in your experience by the sounds of things, it's something you should at the very least dip your toe in and pursue somewhat. And if you come out the other side having learned some lessons, great. Lean into it. Yeah, yep. you lean into that type of uncomfortable feeling. It's like going to knock on knock on a cold a cold door and it's like, hey, my name's James. I'm here from this insulation company and they just shut the door in your face. You're like, whew, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> Next. No, yeah, <laughs> Next it's, one. Yeah. One punch in the face and then the second punch in the face yeah, doesn't yeah, feel so bad, exactly. does it? So in terms of training methodology, we're going to discuss that more on the Omnia Performance Podcast right after this. But thank you very much for your time. Understanding a bit more about who you are as a person but we're going to get nausea with data, information, Killer. and training on a second podcast recording. So thank you very much. Really That's appreciate it. that. And okay. where's the best place for people to find you online? Just at James Newbury on IG. That's the best place. Easy. Killer. Nice one. Thanks a lot.